This is my, I think, fourth WordCamp Boston. So thank you guys again for having me despite being a Yankees fan. Um, if you, uh, if you uh, haven't seen me speak before, uh, my name is Andy Mason. I'm one of the lead developers of WordPress. I actually grew up in New England. Uh, I do like it here, although I live in Washington, D.C. now. You can find me probably in these places in order. Uh, a bug ticket, uh, a bug report, uh, Twitter, and then a distant bug would be email. Um, I do also have a blog that I occasionally use from time to time. Uh, I am Mason pretty much everywhere, Twitter or wherever else. Um, today I'm going to talk about authentication in WordPress. I've been doing this thing for uh, the entire summer. I've gone to a number of WordCamps and whenever I'm talking to a group of developers, I've been using this kind of like my version of TBA, which is Advanced Topics in WordPress Development. I actually really should have come up with something that went to the same acronym as TBA, just to mess with people. Um, and for today, it's authentication, but uh, many of you might have played around with the authentication API in WordPress. Maybe you have toyed with uh, using the authentication filter, or maybe you've done like login through Facebook and things like that. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about any of that. Instead, we're gonna dive into a different area of the API uh, some of it has been existing, some of it is new, uh, because what I think is that it's really important to understand how your system is doing your security. Uh, especially if you are very serious about your security, maybe you're very interested in peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you're generally interested in how secure is your room set up. I left my computer unlocked earlier and Sam Siddler started tweeting from my account. Um, not secure. Uh, more secure would be, let's say, how do I deal with uh, my email, uh, whether it's just using SSL or maybe some level of encryption, uh, or if you're starting to think about how else are you doing communications or working on the internet generally, it's really important to understand how your system is actually secure. There's no cryptography in this talk. I deliberately kept that out of here. Uh, it's a little tough to explain in the span of about 20 minutes. Uh, but with WordPress, you use it every single day. You use, you use the cryptography in WordPress, you use the authentication in WordPress every day, uh, but do you actually understand and know how it works? Uh, and then also another question that I would like to answer is, what is new in this area in WordPress 4.0? So, one of the big issues with, uh, generally with building software is this cost-benefit analysis between security and usability. Almost always to make something more secure, the, the thought is that uh, it will be less usable. And to make something more usable, it's almost always gonna be less secure. Now, of course, what, what people have noticed is that when things are more usable, when they make something secure, people will actually go ahead and use it. Uh, so, for example, there are a number of web-based mail clients that are now doing PGD encryption on their on email automatically for users. And, of course, more people are going to start using it because they don't need to worry about it. The moment you decrease that usability, security can go up, but people may not use it. So, in WordPress, there are a number of things that we do, for example, to increase usability and decrease security, but maybe not really. Some of you might have done this before, perhaps to maybe save an account. Uh, and then a lot of people see this and they go, wow, WordPress is terrible, it is storing MD5 passwords. It's not. Uh, it de most definitely is not doing that. But this still works. You can still do this and it will work. Now the question is of course, why? Now in, in WordPress's case, uh, we use a well-known uh, PHP hashing library called PHP, the PHP Pass, it's been around for since like 2001, give or take, longer than WordPress. Uh, and what happens is that if you do log in with, a PA, with an MD5 hash, which WordPress used to use a decade ago, it will go ahead and authenticate it, and then upgrade it to that new hash and store that new hash. Pretty simple. Uh, moving on to the next piece of the stack is authentication cookies. Authentication cookies have three pieces. This is pretty simple. You, in fact, if you've ever looked at your cookies, you've seen this before. So your username, like admin, and then there's a little pipe, and then you see normally, what, 11 digits now, which is gonna be your Unix timestamp, the expiration of that cookie. And then you're also gonna see a hash. Now, cookies themselves have an expiration, but we need to also enforce that expiration through other means. So, for example, maybe it's just a session-based cookie in the browser that we need to expire after 48 hours. Well, if you leave your browser open indefinitely, that cookie's never gonna expire, we can do it ourselves. So we have this hash as well. And the hash includes, other than some secret information like secret keys, it also includes uh, a, it includes the username, it includes the expiration, and it includes a fragment of your password hash. And the reason for this is because first off, 
by putting the username not just in the cookie itself, but in the hash of the cookie, we're now basically enforcing that that hash can only be used for that username. Makes sense. By putting the expiration there, we're forcing that that expiration can only be used as part of this, uh, part of this cookie hash. And then by putting the password fragment, which is not actually a password fragment, it's the, it's the fragment of the hash of your password, we make it so if you change your password, the cookie immediately can no longer be used. Pretty simple. This is also very standard. In fact, the, implement, the implementation in WordPress as it exists now was done in WordPress 2.5 and was based on a white paper that described all of this. Now, logging out will delete the cookie from your machine, but there's no way to actually invalidate that cookie because all it has in there is just the username, the expiration, and some kind of secret hash that it's, that it's concocted. There's nothing server side. Now, if we look at nonces, this is a nonce as well. We have delete post one, two, three as a sample uh, string that will then become a nonce. Uh, you can see again how this ends up be being gener generated into a nonce. It uses an action with that underscore that you can see there and the object, so one, two, three. The current user, in this case the user ID will be used, and then a time window. Nonces are valid. They're not actually nonces. They're just generally uh, considered uh, uh, CSRF tokens, CSRF, cross-site request forgery, which is what they're designed to prevent. Uh, their tokens, they're valid for 12 hours. Uh, and so what, they, what they're now in uh, 4.0, well, I'll get to that in a moment, let's get that slide. Um, so cookies are not tied to a server-side session. They're not, they're not tied to that at all. Uh, so there's no way to invalidate that cookie until now. So in 4.0, we've introduced now a new concept called user session tokens. Now, this is the reason why I call it user session tokens and not sessions is because we're not talking about the standard super global session. We're not looking at a PHP session here. This is not designed for logged out users. This is not designed for your shopping cart experience. It is not what it is for. Rather, what we're looking for is a simple way to deal with cookie expiration. So, with cookies, we now have a fourth part. We have this token that we've now inserted into here. And this token uh, is also used inside the hash. So this token is a public value that I mean, that you can see as part of the cookie, and then it's also baked into that hash to be able to then protect it, and that way we can verify that it, that it actually is the value that we want it to be. And then a hash of this token, so imagine your password, your, the token is you know password, and the hash is this 64 character thing, that's the sort of user method. So we don't, it's, we treat it like a password because it hypothetically is one, and what we end up in user meta is an object that looks like this where we have this really long hash on the left, and then the value would end up being this timestamp, uh, simply Unix timestamp, as, as our value. So, different ways that this can work. One is that if a user logs in, then we generate a token, we stick it into the cookie, and then we take a hash of that token with, of course, the current time, and we store that in the database. If, when we need to then authenticate a cookie, uh, we go ahead and we take the token out of the cookie, we hash it, and we compare it with the database hash. And as long as it matches, great, you're fine. In fact, it can match any of the hashes in the database, and it's totally fine. And if the user logs out, that token is removed from the database, the cookie's invalidated, it can no longer be used. So now, if you're sitting in a Starbucks, and someone is listening to your web traffic, and you're not using SSL or whatever it is, and that cookie gets, gets intercepted, uh, when you log out, it's no longer going to be a problem. Now, ultimately, what good is this? Because for the most part, users are bad at passwords no matter what. It doesn't really help with that problem. Uh, at the same time, many sites are not using SSL. WordPress.com has the ability to put SSL across all of their domains, uh, or their subdomains. And with uh, WordPress.org, when you're just installing your own site, no shared host is offering an SSL certificate out of the box, even though they really should. Uh, this isn't something that most people are able to do. Try installing an SSL certificate. It takes me like three hours to do, because it's a real pain in the neck. So ultimately, these are arguments both for and against. So on one hand, maybe this token doesn't really help all that much because cookies are just stealable anyway, which is kind of a funny argument to think about that. Uh, and at the same time, maybe it can help a little bit because it gives us the slightest bit more security because you're able to maybe that at least delete that cookie when you're done and invalidate it. So it could help, but at the same time, like why the hell bother? So again, often we have this issue where security and usability come at each other's expense. That doesn't always need to be the case. How can we improve both of them at the exact same time? So in this case, 
for this specific idea of a user session token. There's only two real downsides to usability. The first one is that there's more database churn. We're doing more write queries to be able to insert something in user meta. User meta is going to have more data in it. That will increase the cache sizes. That will possibly cause some problems. So that's not a big deal. Uh, and then secondly, all users will suddenly get logged out and upgraded. In 4.0, any cookie that you have in 3.9 across the entire internet, 23% of the internet will not be able to access their back end without logging in again. That's kind of lame, but we have some ways around this. So for the first one, uh, the, the Session Tokens API was designed with this kind of scalability in mind. You can easily stick another back end behind it. Well, not that easily, but it's pretty simple. Uh, whether you wanted to do maybe a separate database table, which of course we wouldn't recommend. We, it would, ideally, you want to get it outside of MySQL. Uh, something like Redis would make a lot of sense. Now, this is not for your random site. This is honestly, we're talking about tons of users, lots of stuff. If you have less than, let's say, a million or two million rows in your user meta table, you don't need to be worrying about this. Uh, WordPress. I don't know about WordPress.com. I know that WordPress.org is somewhere in like 50 million rows in the user meta table. We're a little slightly worried about this. WordPress.com has a few hundred million rows. So they are thinking about something probably even crazier than Redis. For the vast majority of things, you don't need to worry about it. But hey, we thought about it, so that's good. For the second thing, this idea of logging everyone out. Well, first off, in WordPress 3.6, we added this thing that you probably have seen before. Hey, your session's been expired. So now, if someone else is going, is going through and uh, writing a post, in this case, maybe it's Alice in Wonderland metering in the background. I don't know if anyone else called that. Um, it's a standard format post, by the way. Not, definitely not on the side. Um, if someone, is, if someone is writing this, they might very briefly see this, see this screen while someone else has gone ahead and updated WordPress. They log back in, they get the new cookie, done, problem solved. Also, if you're actually doing the update, you won't be taking the about page right away because you have to log in again. So we've had this message in here for a while. Uh, Helen Husandi, who's running uh, WordPress 4.0, he's around, you should talk to her. Uh, she uh, hates this message. She thinks that uh, my humor from like three years ago is no longer funny. So uh, that said, I think that we should change it. So I'm not kidding. We looked up all the translations that people have done with this. Because the word awesomeness doesn't really translate that well in every language. So we've always told the translators, if we're using something that's kind of like an idiom, or if it's a, if it's a big colloquial, go ahead, or informal, go ahead and translate it to something else. So the Polish team came up with this. This is actually what it translates back to. <laughs> Sit down so it's not to fall from your chair because of the changes and logging again. Uh, there are a number of other funny ones as well. Um, so this is not a big deal. We have this taken care of. Database turn not a big problem. Users logging in again, not a big problem. And then we have this also, we have this upside to usability as well. Uh, we now have a storage mechanism for every session. But what can we actually do with that? And so there are a few things that come to mind, for example. Um, the easy one would be this idea of audit trails for accessing a particular site. We now know that at this particular time, someone logged into this account. Now that's not a whole lot useful at this time. In fact, there are other ways to already log that, and there are a lot of parties that already do this. Uh, but what about something like Gmail style account activity? This was really, uh, as far as I know, this is more or less power, uh, pioneered by Google. This idea of, hey, we'll tell you where else you're logged in, uh, and we can go ahead and Tell, like, tell you, hey, by the way, your phone's doing this, this random application is doing this. What if WordPress happens? Now, that would certainly improve a lot of security, especially because, again, people are bad at passwords. People don't always use SSL. This could definitely be a problem. This could possibly be a solution. There's also this concept of sign me out of everywhere else. Right? That, that can be very helpful as well. I have no idea who that person is, but yes, definitely signing out. Or uh, you, 1995 called and you were in a coffee shop with a terminal and you logged in and then you had to leave and you forgot to log out. Well, that's no longer a problem for you. So the problem is that right now all we're storing is this timestamp. We have this cool hash that's like 64 characters long and I cut it down because it's too long. And then we have this timestamp, but that's not a whole lot of information. So what can we do beyond this? Well, we have this cool new uh, filter called the tax session information that we can go ahead and just say, oh, by the way, when you're setting up a session, just attach the user agent and the IP address to it. Now we didn't do this by default, although we could. We didn't do this by default because we realized that maybe it wasn't the best idea to start storing all of this data for no reason. It's, it's more or less useless until someone's actually doing something with it. 
But this is really nice because it's like, oh, we have data that we can now work with. So now, rather than just storing this single uh, key value, this value becomes this whole other object that represents more information. So it represents an expiration, a user agent, the IP, it represents other information as well. And now suddenly, we can show a user their sessions. So, I would like to do this by WordPress 4.1. There will be a plugin by the time 4.0 is released that does this as a, as a test. Uh, account activity. To be able to say, hey, you're logged into uh, Chrome on Mac OS 10 uh, from Cambridge, and also your phone when you were at the airport this morning. Uh, that was the last time that it was seen. Uh, those sessions are still active. If you'd like to log out, maybe, oh crap, you lost your phone at the airport. Not that I've ever done that before. Um, the last time I was in Boston, I actually left my laptop on the plane. So there's that. Very good at this whole laptop security thing. Um, so account activity is helpful. And then we have some functions as well that handle some other things. Like WP destroy other sessions. As in, please log me out everywhere else. WP destroy all sessions. As in, sign me out everywhere. Maybe log out, maybe someone you know, in, in, a, in a high security environment, maybe log out automatically logs you out of absolutely everywhere. You can set that up if you want to, or you can add another option to say log me out everywhere instead of just log out. Uh, and then there are some other pieces that we can do as well. Where, uh, for example, uh, this is some code that when run, and it should not be run all the time because it's going to generate write queries and do all this other stuff uh, on the fly, it stores a single, uh, one other piece, not just the user agent, the expiration, and the IP, but also when the person was last seen. And so now we can do, uh, we can do something like uh, last seen eight hours ago, or last seen 14 minutes ago, because we have that information. And so maybe you run this only when there's another write query that's already been performed, or when you've already written to user meta, whatever it might be, we now have a little bit more information for this. So you can think about maybe what else you might want to store here. Uh, potentially, it thought would be, well, maybe over time, a session changes places. For example, I logged in uh, earlier today, and then I took my computer somewhere else, and now I'm logged in again. Uh, and then I flew to Russia. Actually, I probably didn't fly to Russia, and I logged in there. There are different things that, you might, that we can easily track. And if you're building a, a big system with a lot of auditing, potentially trying to look for these kinds of problems with the accounts, there's a lot of potential here. So, cool new API uh, in WordPress 4.0. Uh, most of you should probably not need to use it, which is not a bad thing. It's not really a problem. Uh, I really like it when WordPress has APIs that people don't even need to worry about. It just does the work for you. At the same time, I do think that you should be able to understand a lot of the things that are happening under the hood WordPress. And when you get logged out and upgrade for 4.0, now you'll understand why. Again, security versus us usability does not necessarily need to be this bad. There are ways to balance this well and to even increase both of them at the same time. And in this case, and what we're always trying to strive to do, is that we can, we can have security and usability uh, work together and coexist in harmony. Thank you guys very much, and I'd love to take your questions. I have deliberately left a decent amount of time for questions. So if anyone has any questions first on this, that would be good. And then after that, it could be general WordPress core development, WordPress development, Drupal development, whatever it is. I don't know if anyone noticed, but I totally contributed something to Drupal earlier this month. <laughs> um, the WordPress 392 security release was jointly done with the Drupal security team. And uh, me and Mike Adam ended up getting credited in both announcements. That was a lot of fun. So, uh, Will. Yeah, so um, I guess I'm just how does How does the token get invalidated? We end up we end up destroying the hash out of user meta. So when you go ahead and log out, before it actually deletes that cookie, it grabs the token out of that cookie, hashes it, and then deletes that hash out of the, out of user meta. So with the user meta entry stage of the hash is invalid. The hash is no, right. The hash is no longer there. Assuming you're logged in somewhere else, otherwise it might just delete the entire user meta. Any other questions? No other questions? About anything. <laughs> okay, now hands go up. Yeah? Can you talk a little bit about the future of more automatic upgrades and to what points that progress? More automatic upgrades. Um, so at the moment, uh, this is fun. Uh, at the moment, uh, so 392 was released and within about 12 hours we upgraded about uh, 6 million sites. Uh, it had a 99.997% success rate. 
I believe we had something like 100 or 150 sites that had a problem, uh, which is not that bad at all. <laughs> um, the goal is to get that to 100%, and we have a pretty good idea as to how we're going to do that. Uh, one thing that we started to do is uh, in, uh, in uh, the email that you get, if you experience one of those critical failures, you're one of the lucky 100 people or so each release, uh, it ends up saying, hey, by the way, uh, we don't want to just send you off to the support forums. You can reach out to the WordPress team at this private email address. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. You can look at it on the API call if you want, and it goes to me, and I appreciate the email. Um, and the, the benefit to this is, first off, we've kind of like we've damaged our trust with that user by saying, by the way, your site may be down. That is not the email that I wanted to write. Uh, first problem. The second thing is that ideally we're able to work with this user not only to make it so they will never have a problem again, but also we can figure out exactly why they're having this problem and then fix that for good for everyone. So the goal is I think we can do it by the end of the year getting to 100% perfect flawless on these automatic updates. Now, that only goes for actually being able to copy over files. Um, I, uh, I've actually I've given a, some automatic update talks this summer, but I, last time I was here in Austin last year, I spoke way more about this. So if you're here last year, some of this sounds familiar. Uh, the number changed from 99.996 to 99.997. We're getting close. Um, but so the next step is for major releases, and this is no longer about dealing with the ability to just copy files properly, but also not break everything else. Because you have plugins, you have themes, you have all these other issues. So, uh, what I would like to do is take this very slowly across the board. Um, one is that it's possible that it may be something that's opt in as an experimental feature, maybe a checkbox somewhere, but marked as experimental with the idea of eventually be removed and everyone would automatically be opted into it. Uh, the uh, other option would be that we would only do it once we hit that point release, so 401. And then once we do that, we'd be a little more comfortable upgrading someone across versions. Uh, there's a lot of other things that we can do as well where we make sure that all of your plugins are compatible before upgrading, for example. Uh, we can also potentially sandbox. We currently do rollbacks. Uh, most people don't realize this, but if, you, if an automatic update fails, it tries to roll back to the previous version before considering it a critical failure. So there's so many different things that we're considering and making this better. Uh, and I'm really excited for this. There's a number of developers working on this, including Dion Hall, Scary Pendergast, uh, myself, we all worked on the automatic updates originally in 7 Really excited to make it even better. Um, it's going to be a slow process, but the first step is to get it to 100%, and then the next step is to start to get every site that we've updated. Uh, at the moment, we're also doing security releases all the way back down to 3.7. I don't know how long that will last for, but, but at the moment, there's a 3.7 site that's out there that uh, is running 3.7.4, which was never announced. And 373, which was never announced, 372, which was never announced, because we were already on 38 or 39 at the time. So the next step there would be at what point can we just assume that this 37 site is never going to update to 38 and just push them to 4.5? Right? And if by by the time we get to 4.5, we know we can be confident in plugin updates, in compatibility, in sandboxing, and rollbacks. Because that, when we when we do an update even from an old version, we, we new code gets executed. So if we're confident by 4.5 that we can do this upgrade flawlessly, then what's the harm at that point? So it's, these are just random ideas that we're thinking about as to the future of where automatic updates are going. I hopefully didn't scare all of you. I know there's like five more questions on that one. So any other automatic update questions while I'm still on this? Will. Sorry. That's fine. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, PHP nagging and admin. Yeah, and so I'm wondering if, if that would be, I guess what's, you said no to that one, what's the, the, is there a nag if you don't operate, uh, or I guess you're going to be like basically blocking things if you don't have them and you log in, and like you're on 4. Point, you know, WordPress is on 4.5. WordPress is on 4.5 and you're still running like 3.7 and we start to like deny access to the site? No, definitely. <laughs> um, the only thing that will really deny access to it if we're still using IE7, at which point we just shut off features because we don't want to develop them for IE7 anymore. And I guess the point um, are like, okay, so like you're going to leave that person behind. There's a possibility of security vulnerabilities that would be fucked out and we're addressing the possible compromise. Well, the nice thing is, is that for this idea of security vulnerabilities in older versions, 
if that old version is, is, is affected, let's say there are still a million sites on 3.7. And to be honest, that's a ton of sites, but it's only like 2%, so that's not really a ton of sites. But if it takes one developer an extra hour to backport that patch to 3.7 and test it, and then push another button that automatically ships it out with an automatic update, I mean, why not? So I don't want to tell people to stay on 3.7 because it's going to remain a secure branch, but it is because it's, why not gain that extra little bit of speed and why not be able to keep another million sites secure? It doesn't really make sense for us to not try that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to ever make, put users in a, this whole security versus usability issue of your site is no longer usable. That's no fun. Um, the same way that we wouldn't want to, let's say, nag people about their old PHP versions, only because, first off, a lot of them don't know what the hell PHP is. Um, secondly, uh, have you tried upgrading PHP on a shared hosting account? Good luck. Uh, and then third, um, if I, I fear, I especially fear that if hosting your own WordPress site gets any more difficult by like one little tiny bit, they'll just stop blogging and they'll just stop using. So the last thing I want to do is say, like, contact your host to do this. That'd be like, screw this, I'm done. Go on somewhere else. Go on to some other platform. Hopefully, you know, maybe WordPress.com, maybe, no, I'm done on the internet, or I'm just going to use Facebook or something like that. So um, I'm really, like, that's that's why this whole security versus usability thing is really important and why they don't always need to be antagonistic against each other. Did you have a question, or are you just scratching your head? Okay. Uh, yeah. So the question would be plugin compatibility for uh, automatic updates. Currently we do absolutely nothing at all because a, there is no reason for a bug fix, a very targeted bug fix that's only going to be fixing a regression in 3.9 or a security fix to actually cause major damage and break something. I somehow doubt that the plugin was at fault or maybe the plugin was updated as well and that was the problem. Um, I would love to know which plugin it was. I have a, I have a very strong suspicion that it had nothing at all to do with the automatic update. Uh, if only because I put together the 392 release and I know that of the five fixes in there, they shouldn't have broken a single thing. And I haven't seen a single thing broken for it. So a lot of this comes down to, it's not really guesswork, a lot of this comes down to there's a lot of expertise of the people who are putting together these releases. Uh, any one of these releases is being looked at by all the lead developers, uh, usually a significant chunk of the security team to, to make sure that we're not dealing with these problems. That said, that kind of deep, deep review only works for these minor security releases. They don't work, they don't translate to a major release that might have 3,000 changes instead of 5 changes. And that's where we have to start being very careful about breaking plugins. So that's where it starts to get a lot more complicated. But for the minor release, it, it, I, I doubt it was a problem. We don't, we don't look for any compatibility right now. Uh, at the moment, if an update breaks a plugin, I don't call that a compatibility issue, I call that a core bug. We never want to be breaking plugins. We always want to be back to compatible plugins. We never want to cause any kind of fatal errors or parse errors or inability to log in or anything like that. Um, it's possible that a plugin was doing something really weird with like deep in the authentication API that might have caused problems in 392. That said, it would normally try and avoid breaking things, if that makes sense. That's, that's a good goal, I think. Yeah? Is uh, there anything on the horizon for updating or changing user permissions? Updating or changing user permissions. Uh, what are you looking for? There was a med med capabilities. Uh, working in San Francisco last year, I gave a talk on this. Uh, it's also been written about pretty extensively as well. Um, the idea is that there's a lot of ways to 
do very fine-grained capabilities if you wanted to. You could build your own custom role of the five or six capabilities that you might need, but ultimately you can do a lot more power on stuff than that. You could, let's say, say that uh, this particular person can only edit posts if the ID of the post is divisible by five. Like, you could do that with four lines of code. Um, I don't know why you want to, but hey, you could do that one. Um, so that, like, if you wanted to have more flexibility in terms of purely defining roles and capabilities, there's a plugin called Members, probably the best one out there in terms of defining those. Otherwise, the actual system is flexible enough to be able to define roles, to be able to define capabilities, and also to be able to do those kinds of on-the-fly tweaks with the Matmeta cap when the user has cap filters to be able to adjust that stuff on the fly. So I don't think that anything new will come into core UI to support a lot of that. Uh, it's possible that the API might improve a little bit, um, but for the most part, uh, the idea is that it's a really good, simple state right now, and that it's really easy to be able to build more on top of it. Yeah? Uh, I'm just wondering, one thing that's really changed for me and WordPress using as a user uh, is the rise of kind of the paid plugins. And I find that sometimes, uh, especially when I get called into a project that's halfway through, they're already working with a number of plugins and they end up just being upsell. Is there any effort to like, separate the open source plugins from the bit? Uh, or, I don't know, just some. Effort to like separate like paid from open source plugins. Do you mean yeah. like in the dashboard? Yeah, in the search and the. I find it when, when I send people out to find plugins, they come back and usually the paid ones. So, I mean, and, uh, I don't have much control over Google, but I do know that the WordPress.org search only has free plugins. Yeah. Um, but a lot of them have upsells, and sometimes they'll get a big banner ad. Some of them do. If it's, if it's particularly intrusive, uh, you can email plugins at WordPress.org, uh, and they can talk to the plugin offer. If, if problem. Uh, a lot of the times, though, what we especially require is that these plugin authors do not cripple functionality and uh, actually have a real plugin, not just like a shell of a plugin in the directory. Um, I think uh, that... A report, you know, like a report to plugin or, you know, Yeah, you know, I, five stars we've, or we've like thought that. about adding like a report link. The problem is that we feel that it would just end up being a flood of reports and a lot of them would just be like, this plugin doesn't work. So trying to deal with that is not a very fun thing. That said, there are, like, there are reviews for this as well. Giving the plugin a bad review because it has this giant banner in the admin is obviously a legitimate threat. Right. Um, that said, I mean, and there are a lot of other people who could talk a lot better to the to the economic ecosystem of WordPress, whether it's Jake Goldman, Chris Lemma, things with other people of that nature who can talk about how having paid plugins isn't necessarily a bad thing, uh, and that there's a lot of room for both of them. So, also plugins could do pretty much anything, so even if you like segregated them into two different lists in the admin, it wouldn't really help much. Yeah? Uh, tell us about something that can make 4.0 and you're excited about. I'm sorry, tell, uh, something about 4.0 that we'd be really excited about. Well, okay. That didn't make it. That didn't make it in 4.0. Um, I'm not excited about it, because it's not 4.0 now. Um, <laughs> let's see here, so didn't make it into 4.0. Um, so if you go to the plugin installer, uh, which has all these cool, colorful icons. I don't know if anyone saw that. I know, Mel, they're too large, but hey, whatever. I like them. Um, so uh, if you go to the plugin installer, there's another tab. If you're, if you're not on a stable version of WordPress, if you're testing out WordPress, there's one more tab that's called beta testing. If you click that tab, it lists all of the plugins that are currently in development as these uh, features as plugins. So right now, there are, I believe, three on that list, and we need to add a few more. But the three on that list are the front-end editor, which is really cool. Uh, it's so seamless that you don't realize that you're editing, which is part of the problem as to why it's not there yet. Um, <laughs> it's like it really is, you're like, oh crap, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a nervous clicker and a nervous typer and really like everything. So I will like I'll highlight text and I'll accidentally delete it and then it'll save and I'm like, oh crap. So um, the, also the one of the other ones on there is the REST API, the JSON REST API, which is in development now for uh, maybe 4.1, 50-50 uh, chance 4.2. Uh, maybe a little more likely for two, but even then, first quarter next year, it'd be pretty awesome. Uh, and that plugin's already, you could use it now. Uh, if you wanted to use it now, it would be, it's gonna be fully backwards compatible. So when it ends up moving into core, core will be version two of that endpoint. So you can use version one right now, you can leave that plugin there, it will work, you should build things on it. This is a lot of, this is a big chicken and egg problem right now. Uh, we have people who want to like use the REST API and want it in core, but we need, until it gets into core, people won't build things on it. And it's not getting in core until people build things on it. 
So if you want to build something on the REST API, you should do so because the REST API is the stable, 1.0 is usable, 2.0 will be in core, we finally decided that we'll call it 2.0 when it comes in core. Um, so yeah, uh, I, those are the ones that definitely interest me. I don't remember what the third plugin is on the list right now. Anyone know? Press this. Press this, there we go. So press this is also getting a whole new redevelopment thing. It's the bookmarklet that you can use. And it's, I believe the goal is also have some browser extensions that will trigger as well. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, and we'll be adding some more things on there as well. Those are the things that did make it to 4.0. <laughs> things that did make it to 4.0 that are really cool. Plugin installer, uh, editor scrolling, which is probably my favorite thing ever because it's just so perfectly seamless. Has anyone played with 4.0 yet? Why not? <laughs> Seriously, this is fun. Uh, it'll be out in like, uh, like 10 days or so. So you should try it out now and report all the bugs now. <laughs> Great. Because uh, otherwise, then it won't be a very fun release day. Helen is giving me a thumbs down. Please report all the bugs. That'd be great. Come to the contributor day tomorrow, find the bugs, and then fix the bugs. And then Helen will give me a thumbs up. Um, editor scrolling is really cool. If you haven't played around with it, it's, it's probably one of the coolest little like, UI adjustments that we've done in a very long time. And uh, I'm not even going to tell you what it is. You have to go find it. Test it out. So, Write a longer post and then start scrolling around and the thing's gonna start moving on you, it's gonna be great. The toolbar sticks and the, it's cool. <laughs> Other questions? I have uh, like five, six more minutes. Yeah, Chris. Do you ever see a future where WordPress moves away from TinyMC? Do I ever see a future where WordPress moves away from TinyMC? Sure, maybe. I think we should use the best tool that's out there for the job. Um, I was talking about the, the plugins earlier, like the front-end editor. The front-end editor is heavily based on TinyMC. There are a number of other projects that are going on, whether it's um, this idea of like integrating things with customizer or maybe trying all like new prototypes of different ideas that don't necessarily use TinyMC or don't necessarily use content editable. Um, it's really tough to do collaborative editing, for example, with TinyMC and content editable. Uh, normally you're using like operational transformation and a number of other techniques that TinyMC isn't really quite there yet. That said, the one really good benefit of TinyMC is that it has solved so many bugs over the years that we don't need to deal with, it's great. Um, it has thousands and thousands of lines of code that we just don't need to deal with. So for all of its pain, if we replaced it, we would suddenly be like a few years behind in fixing all the edge cases. That said, browsers are also getting better, so it's a little less of a problem. But I don't think any browser has fixed a content editable bug in years, and Chrome just keeps making it worse. But then TinyMC works around it, so it's great. Um, so yeah, possibly, but uh, I think it would possibly look a little different. I don't know if you've seen, uh, there's, a, there's been this uh, concept of like content blocks that's been poking around. Um, that would probably not be done in TinyMC, but it also totally could be. And I would love to see implementations that do it in both, that way we can make the right choice. Um, we've, even if TinyMC goes away at some point, we've also been very much heavily invested in making it better uh, for everyday usage. So for example, 3.9, gallery preview, show up there now. 4.0, if you paste the YouTube video, it just automatically renders the video directly in the visual editor for you. It's kind of cool. Uh, I know a lot of people don't use TinyMC. I love it. I use it all the time. It's, the, it's one of my favorite things in WordPress. Uh, I know a lot of developers are like, what the hell is wrong with you? But hey, whatever. I like it. Um, so yeah, I, maybe. I really I can't answer it because I think that we're not nearly there yet to make a decision. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I'll, I'll do Steven for you. It's, we, so we tried this with themes. So if you install a child theme in the directory, uh, child theme in the directory, the parent theme must also be in the directory, it automatically installs the parent theme. This is fine. Unfortunately, one of the biggest problems with uh, dependencies is that normally most dependency managers, I don't know if anyone uses Composer, NPM, whatever, if it can't resolve it, it just gives up. It's like, hey, you gotta fix it now, here's the problem. Um, that's not really an acceptable like, user-centric software decision. So one of the reasons why we haven't done dependencies yet is because it's really difficult to do them the right way. Um, and if you ever looked at like the coding composer that manages dependencies, whew, it's, there's a lot of uh, jankiness in there. So trying to get this right at the WordPress level is gonna be tough. Do we do it so you're able to choose, like specify a plugin as a dependency or specifically a, you know, versions of that plugin as a dependency? And then you start to get the issues of well, plugins use also different versioning, so they have to use semantic versioning. 
what if that plugin isn't necessarily designed to be a dependency, and then they suddenly like break something, and then they both get updated, and then something, it's just, so many things can go wrong, it's actually easier to not do it than to do it. I'm not saying that WordPress shouldn't do it, I think you should do it, it'd be great. Um, and also there's some other issues of dependencies as well, where you know you search for this plugin, and it's like debug bar console, and you install it, and it installs debug bar for you. That's easy. Or it tells you, hey, well, I'm gonna install the debug bar. But then you search for this other thing that's like user spamming, and then it, it like installs BuddyPress for you. Suddenly, like your entire thing has changed. That doesn't make any sense either. So there's there's different concepts of like what a dependency is, whether it's like a library that needs to be used, or whether it's oh by the way this is like a whole separate BuddyPress thing, or like you just install this thing that just installed WooCommerce. For surprise, you have a, you have a store. So um, there are a lot of issues there as well. Yeah. Front end ending into WordPress, I, I have no idea. I, at the moment, it's actually just a really cool test project, but a lot of things have been pulled out of it. So uh, the same person who did the front end editing uh, plugin also did editor scrolling uh, in in 4.0, and a lot of knowledge was in one, got came over the other. Uh, also, uh, this idea of uh, visual embeds uh, that's now in 4.0 also originated in the front end editing plugin. So in many ways, it's like a test bed for cool new stuff. Um, I, I would love to see it at some point. It's, it's honestly miraculous. It works with everything in, like, as, as designed out of the box. There, most of it is not the editing part. It's the rest of it. It's all the usability of when do you want to like enter the that screen versus the admin. I don't know if you've ever used. I mean, if you use you, yeah, if you use P2, you click the edit link and it just opens it in a line. That's fine until you want to deliberately go to the admin, and then like you have to frustratingly like copy the link and then go to the admin. It's just that kind of thing is, it's its just, it's all about intuition and you know, a computer can't read your brains yet. So um, there's a lot of different issues there of how can we bring all of the editing experience to the front end, so like tagging and all these other things, or maybe we keep that out of the front end and we push it to the end. Uh, it's a cool plugin and you should use it if you want it. I don't know when it would necessarily come into WordPress. But I think there's a lot of really cool stuff going on in editing. I think there's a lot of nibbling around the edges of this bigger problem where whether it's content blocks, front end editing, the customizer, uh, some editing is not going through the customizer in some plugins. Um, and this idea of like these three problems are all kind of going around the same issue of how can we make it so customization, editing, and writing is all one giant seamless experience. The worst thing about the front end, I mean, one of the things that the front end editor that, that takes like, ah, is that I want to, you know, suddenly change my site tagline can't just double click it and edit it. Or I want to change this widget, and I can't do that because that's in the customizer. And I go to the customizer, and I'm noticing that, oh, this headline for this post is like wrapping. I should change the, 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 the word, and you can't because that's not in the customizer. So like little things like that, there's a lot of user experience stuff that needs to be improved there. That said, I think it's awesome. And I think it's really cool that there's all these different experiments happening. Uh, there's just some really good stuff. Time for like one or two more questions. Anyone have a good one? It's a good one. <laughs> what is, it? What is, it? Um, is there anything out there in other systems that you're looking at going, I wish we had that? Uh, anything out there in other systems that I wish we had that? You know, I think we've done a really good job at working on improving a lot of the core features that we've had. Uh, a great example would be like in, in Media in 3.5. If anyone remembers what Media was like in 3.4 and you didn't stab out your eyes, congratulations. Um, we studied about 15 or 20 other systems that were out there. So, I mean, you name a system, like whether it's Tumblr, Squarespace, we, we looked at all of them, and we decided that none of them did media the way that we thought it could be done, and that none of them did media the way that like WordPress should do. So we end up, we end up you know, maybe like looking at a lot of the different ideas out there, uh, but usually end up doing our own thing. Um, anything specific, let's see here. I would really like an API that's not based on XML. So good thing is we're building that. <laughs> but um, I, that, there's a number of pieces that we could steal that from. Uh, at the same time, building APIs of this nature is really difficult because we're not actually building an API. We're building a framework for other people to build APIs on top of WordPress. And they can implement, they can interact with any client and all these other problems, and it becomes this really big mess. So I was at an API conference a few weeks ago with a bunch of like API evangelists who do this for a living, and they were listening to me and Ryan McHugh, who is the developer for the REST API, uh, talk about our, pro our challenges with WordPress, and they're like, hey, you do, you do not envy you at all. Yeah. So, um, I know I didn't really answer your question because I couldn't think of anything, but I tried. No, that's good.
All right, and I think that's it. I will be around uh, all evening today, and also, um, so please find me and harass me with questions. Um, also, talk to Helen about 4.0, because uh, she's been rocking it, and uh, she would love some feedback, and some, preferably some stuff like, I've been using the error scrolling, and it's amazing, things like that. So, Helen, smile. There we go, okay. Um, and then also, please come to your tribute day tomorrow, because it'll be fun, and we'll work on patches and testing and things like that. All right, thank you guys very much, really appreciate it.